Well, it's difficult really to say something concrete about a whole nation, but I think maybe, you know, Iceland is working in a different tempo from most of the other nations I have known. Uh, I think maybe it's because we are so few and we're always, we always think we are a lot more of us than there are. So all of us are really running around and doing things at extremely fast tempo. And you can see that both in the revolution that happened here, how we've been working and sorting out our affairs after the crisis and I'm very happy about that even though people were rather pissed off after the crisis to say the least. I think with what we as a nation we are trying to sort it out in a creative way. You know, we are looking at new ways in our employment, how we can how we can create new industries and I can mention creative industries, I can mention IMI and we're thinking how we can really rebuild the society in a new way. So I think what we're trying to do, we're trying to be creative, to sort this thing out, and I think that's maybe the positive thing about the crisis, you know. There are always opportunities in every crisis, and I hope that other, other, other countries in Europe will look at it that way, that there are uh, ways to sort things out with enough creativity. And that's what we have been doing, but it hasn't been easy. <laughs> in 2008, everybody suddenly woke up in this country. And the nation had been like asleep for a while and then woke up. A lot of things happened almost overnight in Iceland. Uh, something happened like within the, within the heart and soul of the Icelandic people. Many people now will say that they are grateful and thankful for the financial crisis. We certainly needed the wake-up call. I think many people think this way and for those who don't think this way I think they will maybe in five years or in ten years they will think thank God for the financial crisis. <laughs> because I think we will recover well from it and we will gain a much, much, much better country from it. There was a national assembly where a thousand people, like just chosen from the national registry at random, they came together after the crash and they were talking about between themselves what values I mean, what do we value? What kind of society do we value? And the, the number one thing, by far, that most people said was honesty. That's what we wanted. Honesty. And transparency and information freedom is, is the practical application of that when it comes to government. And, yeah. Not only did we have a, have a collapse, which then uh, uh, a parliamentary committee, research committee, 
said was because that uh, the business uh, uh, business community had such influence on the politicians that that was that was basically uh, one of the major reasons for the crash so that's corruption right that's that's what transparency international defines as corruption when you use public power for private gain right and then transparency international had been saying all along that iceland was the least corrupt country in the world so i think it came as a shock to us not only was the, the collapse but we a lot of us thought that Iceland was quite free of corruption, which was absolutely contrary to, contrary to, the, to the truth. So then it's like, hey, we did not have information about that. Why did not, didn't we know that? That's a question that a lot of people asked. Uh, after the banking crisis, there was a huge criticism uh, towards the media for having not spotted all the weak points in the banks. Uh, having been almost complicit in, uh, in uh, hiding the, the reality of how uh, vulnerable and how corrupt these uh, banking institutions were. It is a bit of an unfair criticism because, uh, of course, you had the Bank Secrecy Act, which was uh, uh, put on a steel wall around, around the banks. Uh, but up to a point, it was a, a justified criticism. So after the banking crisis, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the media, the journalists had to, uh, had to defend themselves and uh, accept some responsibility and uh, take part in, in, uh, in analyzing what went wrong. Uh, the media, like uh, the rest of society, uh, bought into uh, the propaganda that uh, this was uh, something unique, Icelandic, that uh, the Bucks had found a way of uh, doing things that uh, nobody else had. And the fact is that uh, those few reporters that uh, understood business and banking, most of them were bought away by the very Bucks themselves, and they could pay uh, higher wages than, uh, than the media could. So we have a number of instances where uh, good journalists were simply offered jobs uh, either for the banks directly or for public relations firms that uh, worked for the banks for a much higher wage uh, than uh, the media could uh, offer them. So uh, people were not very suspicious about uh, what they were told. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, of course, we can see that, of course, uh, the media should have been uh, more thorough in its investigations. But we have to bear in mind also that in Iceland, investigative journalism um, has never been a very big part of uh, the journalism work, simply because it's so time consuming and uh, thus it is expensive. If you are a journalist and, and your editor or you, the owner or someone don't like you because you are digging in something they don't want you to do, uh, it's very difficult to go to some, somewhere else because there are very few media. We cannot guarantee that an investigated journalist will look into a matter, but there's one thing we can do. We can at least build a framework on top of this information system we have, which incorporates radio, television, internet and newspapers, a mechanism to ensure the safety of the people and the safety of the information. So information is vital and IMI is to protect the mechanism of the information flow. If the journalist knows and it's clear for him that his work is to inform the people and that he knows that there is some laws that protect him from being attacked. And being attacked, when I say that, is from everybody because a journalist can be attacked from the editors, from the owner's publicist who is doing the publicity and he can also be attacked from the people who he is talking about. When you have an investigator 
investigation journalist who really wants to dig into things. This is what we would want. We're protesting something that we don't want. So what do you want? This in me, you know. See. We are protesting what the bank's secrecy. You know, we demand that we stop having secrecy in the banks. They say, okay, you don't want this, what do you want? It is one of the things that we do want. This is one of the things that would be, would be appropriate to be a part of, uh, of, a, of a future, more democratic society. It actually started a long, long time ago, it seems. It was actually in uh, just after the crisis, like a year after the crisis, I was invited to speak uh, at a conference for the Digital Freedom Society uh, because I was the only sort of nerd in the parliament. Uh, and just prior to me speaking, Julian Assange and Daniel Domscheitberg were speaking about an idea that John Perry Barlow originally introduced a year earlier at the same conference about Iceland could become like Switzerland of bits, a safe haven for freedom of information, expression of speech. In order to create the greatest of human, humankind's creations, the collective organism of mind, and in order to be a good ancestor, which I think you want to be. I would call upon you to do everything you can to give people the right to know. Thank you. When they presented this idea, it was the right time. Uh, also because finally it was somebody in Parliament that understood the importance of it and the importance of use in the crisis for something that would be in the benefit for all the people, not just the so-called 1%. Then when they arrived, we, we had this conversation which um, basically led to the creation of, of the idea that we could take the best laws from different countries around the world and put them into one package and, and share, you know, implement them here in Iceland. And this was a very kind of broad idea and, and Julian Assange gave us a list of laws which they had noticed were very good and, and they had considered useful to their operations in Wikileaks. Thus started the process of analysing all the different laws uh, that have something to do with freedom of information, expression and speech in the day and age we live in. Because freedom of information uh, and freedom of speech and expression, most of these laws are very old. They date from the 17th century. So we went on a scouting mission, uh, looking for all the best laws that function in reality, that don't only look good on paper. And um, so we sort of cherry-picked all the best laws we could find from around the world. We decided uh, in this process of, instead of writing out 10 or 12 different laws to make a proposal tasking the government to do this extensive changes in our system in order to create the safe haven. And uh, by mapping out exactly how we wanted the laws to be and to put in that we wanted the spirit of the laws to represent always the best functioning laws at any given time uh, to ensure that we indeed could have this, uh, be the safe haven. The safe haven is uh, based on, on, on good legal structure and uh, the willingness of the government to go by the laws and, and uh, having a stable environment politically and etc. So a safe haven is some place you can trust that the law will be abided by. A safe haven isn't anything other than just the opportunity to relax a bit, to do, go about the things that you need to do and to, to live a nice life while you're doing important stuff. Now, if we can create a safe haven, then that means that people who uh, are fighting every day to you know, get out information that's important for you know, regulating governments and, and um, you know, protecting people. That 
you know, we, we can't save them from bullets, we can't stop them from being killed in, in the fields of, uh, you know, war or, or uh, being decapitated by drug cartels or any of the other horrible things that are going on out in, out in the real world. But we can at least try to make it so that whatever it is they do, their information has a place where it's safe. <laughs> if a document is not available, then it needs to be either for privacy or national security reasons or because it's a working document, or it has to do with a regulatory um, function of, uh, of the state. But in those cases, it, the, the uh, document still needs to be listed along with why it's not available, who decided it shouldn't be available, on which authority, and when it will become available, because there should be a time limit on all of these. So doing this would definitely change a lot of uh, regarding the transparency. One of the reasons we're in such a mess is because of lack of transparency. Uh, if you have a lack of transparency, it is harder to make people uh, be accountable for you know, either the stuff they do well or badly. And uh, within the shadows, the corruption thrives. And uh, so we are trying to transform our society from the culture of secrecy by default into transparency by default and have a debate about the stuff that needs to be secret. What we feel frustrating in particular is that when we are asking for certain kind of information, uh, we are not allowed to get it. Uh, and. Uh, the government can decide, yes, that uh, they don't want to talk about uh, some things uh, and then we, very little th that we can do. Let's say the negotiations with the, with the EU, where government has uh, promised to be very uh, open and transparent, but in some instances uh, we have found it difficult to, to, to get information. If you don't have access to information uh, that should belong in the public domain, uh, you can't take enlightened decisions, you ta can't take wise decisions if you don't have the facts. Uh, and then you usually end up trusting somebody else to make the decisions for you. And that is a, a dangerous attack on democracy. And at the, at the day and age where we can have access to all the information in the world, if it is made easily accessible, uh, then we should. Currently there is no whistleblower protection law in Iceland and there isn't in most countries in the world. But whistleblowers are a group of people who need to be protected because they are effectively uh, coming forward with information and, and uh, threatening their own security for the, you know, the exposure of the truth and that can expose criminal mis uh, wrongdoing, mismanagement of public funds, any sort of corruption. Well, it could be a person, for example, working for the government or working for a big company which has access to a lot of information. And if he witnesses something that is disturbing information for the nation, information that the general public needs to know about, then he can, as it says, blow the whistle. What we need for him what we need for the person who blows the whistle is that he or she does not have to be frightened for his or her life, for his or her job, for his financial situation, to be sued or charged or put in jail. Let's say if some somebody from a big company uh, leaks information about pollution or something, 
the company cannot fire him or he will be guaranteed payments of some sort if he is fired. He should not feel, feel it on his skin that he has done a good job for his nation. If you are not guaranteed, then uh, you will not tell anybody what you know. And before the crisis, that was really the problem. Uh, people knew, but instead of informing the, the, the media, they just quit their jobs. They uh, said, no, no, I cannot uh, um, comment on anything. I just quit my job. I, I signed a paper where I promised not to say anything. Uh, so we never got the, the information. We, there are a few cases like, uh, like that before the crisis. Today, those people come and say what really happened. So we are on the way of uh, accepting the information also because someone who tells you that he, he didn't want to work for company X just because he didn't like uh, the owner, well, that's one thing. But when you know that he didn't want to work because they were cheating, <laughs> that's something else. The, the ideas of EMEA is, of course, to, uh, to make people in that business braver. Escalation of government secrecy all over the world. Uh, increased willingness by corporate giants to abuse their powers. Uh, secrecy breeds corruption, increased corruption, and uh, increased willingness to use violence. Uh, we see that in the crackdown on whistleblowers in the United States. Uh, a total hypocritical, hypocritical uh, uh, president who fought on the platform to, uh, to protect the whistleblowers and encourage them. And you have quotes from his uh, speeches in 2008 when he was fighting for election. Uh, nowadays, the Obama administration has done more to crack down on whistleblowers than any other presidents in the US after the Second World War combined. And on the basis of basically treason, and the Espionage Act of 1917. Absolutely a, a, a horrible trend that we're seeing there. Whistleblower is someone like Bradley Manning. Bradley Manning is a whistleblower. And we need a constitutional protection for the Bradley Mannings of Iceland. You know, that's, that's what we need. And that's what we really, really, really want to get. Source protection applies to journalists who are working at uh, registered journalistic agencies. And the rule is that uh, a journalist or anybody who finds out the identity of a journalistic source uh, can go to prison for up to six months if they expose the source. A court, on the other hand, can decide that uh, the source should be exposed on very specific conditions. If there is a criminal case ongoing, and there is no other way to, to resolve the case. It would have to be an extreme case that uh, a court could compel a journalist to reveal his sources. I simply see it in very, very, very few cases. And anyway, I think that, uh, I mean, journalists are respons most, more, more or less responsible citizens in their country. Uh, they would not try to hide sources or hide knowledge of a serious crime. So source protection is a very good thing, absolutely. Telecommunication state of retention is the idea that the government can require all telecommunications companies to spy on everybody always for free. 
uh, means that they monitor the origin, destination, the duration, um, the starting point and uh, the amount of data flowing through any communication, whether it's a phone call or a visit to a website or anything through the internet, and this is entirely unacceptable. This is uh, a very strong breach of privacy, it's a uh, breach of any rules of proportionality, and uh, essentially it, it even goes so far as being a threat to national security because if you're monitoring everybody's communications always then you're also monitoring the communications of the police, the Coast Guard, the, uh, the President, the Prime Minister uh, and so on and so forth and anybody who has access to this information can start to build a profile of where these people go, who they meet, who they talk to the most. So essentially data retention needs to be uh, eliminated entirely. The Constitutional Court of Germany struck data retention down uh, a couple of years ago. Um, they said that the implementation in Germany was unacceptable, it was a violation of privacy rights. Uh, but Germany uh, has since then decided that they're not going to re-implement the law. Uh, similarly, the Czech Republic and Romania, have uh, the constitutional courts in both of those countries have struck down data retention as being unconstitutional. Only, unlike Germany, they said that the entire directive was unconstitutional. So there's a growing amount of reasoning behind not implementing it in general. But in Iceland it was implemented a year before the European Union. We have to basically remove one paragraph from the law and once that paragraph is gone then our telecommunications are free. Despite the ban on prior restraints, which is in the Icelandic constitution, there are a couple of cases um, every year where that is requested. There's a general rule which uh, has been stated as publish and be damned. You'd be able to publish anything, but when you've published it, then you can be found uh, tried and found guilty for having published it. You should never be prevented from publishing anything. That's a kind of complicated issue because some people, you know, I, I'm taking a very extreme view on, on this particular issue. And others might say, well, you know, would, uh, would you not say that there should be possible to get an injunction against, say, the publication of medical records? And the fact is, it would be really nice if we could be that strict in the way that we apply this. But in reality, it's never going to work that way because uh, not everybody will always know that medical records are about to be published, so they, they might not be able to get a, an injunction. And then there's others who might say, well, you know, this little detail is actually similar to a medical record, uh, so I should get an injunction anyway. It's always going to be, you know, once you open up that floodgate, there, there will be all sorts of exceptions and all sorts of uh, abuses of the rule. So the best way to go about it is just to accept that we cannot sensibly regulate the publication. But what we can do is we can punish people very severely if they do go and violate privacy by publishing medical records or national secrets. You know, generally people just need to be aware that there are certain limits and if you want to violate them, go ahead, but there will be consequences. People need to be, uh, take responsibility for what they print, what they publish. I was the news anchor that night and uh, I received word literally a minute before we went on air that uh, the uh, injunction um, had been placed on us so we could not broadcast the story that was going to be our leading story that night. And that was because uh, Kryptink Bank did not uh, want certain information uh, from their loan book to, uh, to be published. But what they failed to do is that they failed to take out an injunction against other media. So other media could report uh, exactly what we had hoped uh, to, to report that night. 
uh, and we simply pointed them to uh, the origin of our story, which was Wikileaks. We repeated it on the air. You can just go to wikileaks.org uh, to, to see uh, what it is that we are prohibited from, from broadcasting. Gott kvöld, nú hefjast fréttir, laugardaginn 1. ágúst, samt ekki allar þær fréttir sem ætlum að segja ykkur. Því að í kvöld ætlum við að greina frekar frá risavöxnum, lána fyrir greislum kaupþings til fyrirtækja í eigenda hópi bankans. Við getum að því niður ekki. Sýslumaðurinn í Reykjavík samþyktir nú rétt fyrir fréttir, beðinni kaupþings um lögban við byrtingu og umfjöllun um trúnaðarkögn frá stjórnarfundi bankans í september í fyrra. Þar var fjallað um lánveitingar til stærstu viðskiptavinna bankans. Og það er rétt að taka fram að lögbannið á einungis við fréttaflutning ríkisútvarsins. Aðrir miðlar á Íslandi geta því áfram notað gögnina vild og allir geta nálgast þau á vefsíðinni wikileaks.org, wikileaks.org. I simply don't remember whether there was any reasoning behind it. They just went to a judge and they got an injunction forbidding us for, from broadcasting the story. In the end it was counterproductive for the bank because it drew attention to the story. So it, instead of being a big story, it turned out to be a huge story. I mean, people thought, aha, those guys have something to hide, which they did, of course. <laughs> the Icelandic libel laws are terrible. They were written in the 1940s. They are convoluted with uh, ideas of hate speech and privacy rights. Uh, and because the three are, are packed together, um, they're often treated as a much more serious thing than they actually are. Judges have been uh, giving out very bad and very heavy verdicts against journalists for libel. Some of the times it's ridiculous, the things people are attacking us for. But they do it because uh, it's easy to win in Iceland against the media, because uh, secrecy is uh, very important for judges. <laughs> and uh, for me, they don't really make the difference between information the public has to know and the information that is not relevant. There's no such thing in Iceland as punitive damages, meaning that uh, you, the court cannot just award uh, several million kronas to the plaintiff just because uh, his ego was tarnished. Um, instead, it's more that if the plaintiff can show that he actually lost money or property because as a direct effect of the case, then there can be damages awarded, but otherwise there shouldn't be. Simple as that. Yeah, I'm just kind of part-time working at the, t the paper and uh, university and this like 1.2 million for one case, 1.2 million for another case, it's 2.4 million plus interest plus my lawyers maybe 4 or 5 million. That's like 30, 40,000, 30,000 euros. This is surreal, ridiculous and if it comes to that, uh, you know, I will need to pay something, I, I will not, you know, I will just go bankrupt. And I will never pay this and, and I will laugh, you know, but, but it's not, it still is not fun or a joke to declare bankruptcy, you know, it's, uh, it has consequences. It's, it feels like bullying, which is constantly bullying, because the people who do this, they normally have the money. So, for them it's not much. But the good news is that two cases, with two journalists went to the European Human Rights Court and they won, so they won uh, against Iceland. And that might affect my cases too, which are being prepared and are probably going to go to there too and through there. So that's the positive news too. So 
EMI and maybe Europe <laughs> will maybe save us from this period. Some some people have called like a, a just period of of silencing in Iceland. It's and so much silencing that it hasn't really been talked much about until after the new cases in in Europe. People are like opening up and saying this has been ridiculous. And, and these are the years before the economic crash and the economic collapse. And and I'm t telling you about my cases, and they are not about finance or banking or anything. But I think you just need, you know, few little cases to to silence the whole. And that's that is what happened before the crash and after the crash, and is still happening. But hopefully, Immi will uh, change that, and maybe the Icelandic judges will. Uh, will have to start to listen to the world and, you know, something like that. Every time a story is being taken down, or it's changed. It's like a modern book burning where, where one page in a book in every library is burned at the same time. And it's because it's so easy, it is so important to have laws that protect it. Back when newspapers were printed, it would have been impossible for anybody to do as uh, Winston, the hero of 1984 did. His job was to sit around and change the news stories in the newspapers back in time to reflect the political leaning of Ingsoc uh, government to, to fit whatever it was that particular day. Logistically it wouldn't have worked. But now everything is on the internet, everything is in databases that can be searched and it is very easy to pull out a story that doesn't fit with the way uh, a government or a private individual wants it to be. The problem is arising that uh, increasingly rich people in particular have been going to newspapers and saying we're going to sue you for libel for this uh, thing that you published uh, so and so many months ago uh, unless you pull it out of your database. And newspapers, you know, pub uh, stuff they've published many months ago, they don't really want to waste time defending that in court. So it's easier for them just to pull it out. We need to prevent that from happening because this is a, a direct violation of the historic record. The historical record of, of our society is being changed retroactively. That's not very good. We, we can prevent lawsuits against news which was published more than so and so many months ago. Probably two or three months is, is the right number. We can also require that uh, news articles, uh, that the databases be copied over to the National Archives uh, with a certain amount of regularity. And that way uh, the person who would be attacking would uh, be attacking on two different fronts. One, the, the media organization which has uh, falls under media law, but also the National Archives which has a, a archival uh, requirement. And that would raise the bar quite a bit. Let's say the printer is printing a book and uh, because it's a controversial book the state comes in and say look we're going to close down the printing facilities unless you stop printing this book. It would be a massive uproar in our world. At the same time internet uh, providers are constantly being threatened to be shut down if they don't shut down websites. Instead of attacking the sender or the recipient of the, the message people are certain to attack the intermediary itself uh, with court cases, uh, with police breaking down the doors of the server farms and ta ta confiscating computers. Intermediaries need to be protected because otherwise telecommunications as a concept are at risk. This is very simple. One of the things that we can do is uh, put courts in between the attackers and the intermediaries themselves. The current process is in particular with regard to copyright violations. 
is that uh, somebody comes to the intermediary and says, this is a violation of copyright, you need to take it down. And the intermediary is required by law to take it down. Regardless of the question of whether the person who comes to them actually has, uh, has a claim to that material, uh, without any check of whether it's fair use or satire or uh, any kind of legitimate use of the content, it just has to be taken down. Uh, this alone, in addition to all of the court orders and all other mechanisms that are targeted at intermediaries, uh, is just increasing the legal costs greatly. So if we stick a court in between them, then that's the, the first step. There are many others, but um, if we just get that one done, then computer hosts, uh, whether they're hosting providers or telephone companies or whatever, uh, will be have a much safer operating environment. There are a few countries in the world, the United Kingdom is one of them, where the burden of proof for defendants in libel cases is quite heavy. So instead of the person who's uh, the plaintiff, the person who sues for libel, being uh, obliged to prove that uh, a statement was libelous, the defendant needs to prove that it wasn't. Due to that and many other uh, details of British libel law, is it's complex enough that many people go bankrupt. In fact, the, the way it works is the person who can throw the more money at the case generally wins. We don't have the ability here to change British libel law, but we do have the ability to defend against it. Um, due to the Lugano Treaty, which uh, we're a party to, if a court verdict in, in another country in, in Europe is given out, then Icelandic courts are required to enforce it. With the exception, which is a nice bit, of uh, things which go against the general rule of law in Iceland. This means that if we have a uh, libel law which uh, would not admit that kind of verdict, then uh, an Icelandic court could refuse to enforce the, the British verdict. That basically means that libel, uh, libel tourism is over. The libel law, which is known in the UK, and which is really all about ensuring the rich people's rights <laughs> towards the media and not the right of the media. So we need, what we're trying to do is really ensure that balance. So we ensure the rights of the general public, of course, but also ensure the rights of the media. We need to be bold, but yet we need to be careful because it, of course it matters that uh, we change the law so it's really, so we can really reach our purpose, which is ensuring the liberty of the media at the same time ensure people's rights against the media. So it's really important to keep that balance uh, and we have seen in other countries things going way too far in the direction ensuring people's rights against the media but not the rights of the media. When the IMI proposal and the initiative went on, it was uh, a parliamentary proposal to make Iceland, uh, give Iceland the speciality as a safe haven uh, for, for information, freedom, transparency, freedom of the press, protection of sources, all these things that we need for information freedom. And that was supported by people from all parties. They were co-sponsors with, with Birgitta. It's extremely important that we do have people inside places of power so that they can understand the system, so we can tweak and change the system from within. Uh, because it's not going to happen only from outside. So I was inside the system and I, I figured out with the help of the people uh, at the committee level in the parliament how to do this so that it had any chance of being moved through the parliament. I, I come from the smallest party and I couldn't even 
get my party members excited about it because they just simply didn't get it. But it was to my great surprise that uh, I got a unanimous vote for it. Which of course gives it an even stronger mandate to finishing it. Nobody believed that I could even get it through into voting. Uh, because at the time there was no culture for parliamentary proposals of this magnitude to be uh, processed to the final uh, states of voting. But it just proves that anybody can actually do this. If I could do it, uh, anybody can. It is actually quite astonishing that you could get uh, every uh, parliamentarian uh, party in, in, uh, in the Iceland parliament to agree on a single proposal. I mean, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, Icelanders tend to be very conflict-oriented. Uh, in their uh, polit politics. Uh, but you have to see it in the light of the banking crisis and, and the, the, the total shock to the society and the system and the, the uh, thirst and the need for uh, transparency and uh, accountability all over society. Nobody in the parliament could have stood up and said no. How would he look like if he said no? But now we have to get it uh, accepted in the parliament and they have to have the discussion one number one, one number two and number three. So uh, on the way many things may change. It is uh, to to make Iceland that that uh, safe haven, which, EMI, which the EMI initiative proposes. Uh, there needs to be changes to at least 14 laws, and uh, these changes need to go through uh, four uh, ministries. So it's a, it's a big process, but there have already been changes. Well, we changed the law on uh, Icelandic media. Actually, Iceland did not have. Uh, a holistic law about media uh, until last year. So that's a new law. Uh, actually that law had been in preparation for several years but when this uh, proposal was agreed upon in the Icelandic Parliament uh, we decided to review that bill so it would really fit better into the purpose of uh, the IMI project. So that was the, really the first step, changing the law and really creating a new law on media. Uh, now we are actually we have created a group which involves uh, several ministries and also uh, people from our uh, media committee and from the IMI uh, institution. So that group is supposed to really lay, uh, put down a plan on how we are going to change different sets of laws. As we move forward we are seeing some other things. Originally there were 14, I think there are 16 now. So we are we're, we're becoming aware of some other dangers, I think definitely things will not go exactly as we propose them, but maybe the way we propose them is not the, the, the best way to do it. Our focus will always be on does it have the end results that we want, that people have the information they need to take informed decisions in a democracy. It will take time and quite an effort and there is a lot of obstacles on the way, I mean international treaties that has to be dealt with. How are you going to bypass international treaties? We said that you have to uh, respect uh, uh, judicial decision in another country when you're trying to build a safe haven for information, uh, try to uh, build a safe haven from libel tourism and uh, build a, a safe haven for whistleblowers and informants. Uh, we live in an, an international societies. We've seen how those who are going after whistleblowers and informants how they can reach uh, cross boundaries and I, of course I know, know that from my work for Wikileaks how that is happening. We also see how the uh, extremely strong copyright lobby is able to mobilize an army of policemen uh, raiding homes in faraway countries. So a lot, a lot of things have to be taken into account and it can be an extremely difficult position for Iceland alone to take the entire steps. This will not happen overnight of course. I mean this project 
for us, I mean for EMEA to implement the law in Iceland, I don't know, it may take some years. Our biggest threshold might be the constitutional change that we really, really, really need. I think we cannot call us uh, information and freedom of expression paradise if we don't have the constitutional guarantees that we need. It might be a little optimistic to, um, for us to get all of these things into our constitution, but I think this is what we really need. And uh, Parliament has already anonymously agreed to the initiative, so I think they will have to agree upon this. When we have all the law change that we want to be want to change, uh, we have to also spread the word. Uh, we have to spread the word in Iceland because we want journalists and people and you know people with information. We want them, of course, to use the law. Also, talk about talk to people all around the world, both to. Uh, bring up the opportunity for like international media to come to Iceland and be based here to use uh, the Icelandic jurisdiction and our laws and also to influence other countries. In other countries people are realizing that this is a good thing. For me that would be more of a success for, for IMI if uh, another, another country, a bigger country, uh, would implement the, these ideas. Uh, and I think really the point of IMI is not uh, connected to, directly to Iceland at all. There are quite a number of sites and servers in Iceland because of IMI that already come here because of IMI, even though IMI has not been implemented. Bueno, mucha gente nos dice que incluso, incluso gente de Islandia nos dice que la IMI no es todo lo que parece, que falta mucho, pero nuestra motivación es que a lo mejor por más que no, no hayan logrado todavía todo lo que quieren lograr, al final es la única iniciativa tal vez en el mundo de, de, de ese tipo, es como el único grupo que, que está luchando por proteger fuentes y periodistas. Y eso, como eso nos da, nos da motivación para estar aquí. Para nosotros no hay otra salida es estar aquí o estar en algún sitio que será menos seguro. Entonces, por más que aquí no sea el sitio perfecto en términos de seguridad, es el sitio más seguro para estar. It's not like the important thing for me to get the inter international media to come to Iceland. But the fact that it can is interesting to me. I mean because jurisdiction can be uh, important. If the if the uh, media is stationed in Iceland, the jurisdiction is Icelandic, so they, the Icelandic law will apply. So if they get a, a, the most protection for their like journalists and sources here, then they would maybe like to be stationed here. And if other countries want to compete with us about that, well, that's what exactly what we want, because they then they will have to implement their laws to try and get the international media to be in their countries. It would be very nice to have more data centers in Iceland. Currently we have a lot of clean energy, we have a very good climate for data centers and it would be a great benefit to the Icelandic economy to have lots of data centers here. But that should really be a first to market benefit, meaning that uh, because Iceland is taking these steps and trying to be the first, Iceland should benefit economically by getting more data centers and so on. But Iceland should be the first, it should not be the only one. Uh, hopefully lots of other countries will start adopting the kind of IMI style proposals. When that happens, then Iceland's market advantage will disappear, uh, unless we keep raising the bar, which would be very nice. But even then we can expect it to disappear. So we have that window. And during that, you know, in that window, we have to make a lot of sensible investments and, and attract a lot of investments from abroad. But the ultimate goal must always be that all of the world has better free speech regulation.
todos los países debían hacer un, su propio IMI. No sé, el mundo que vivimos ahora en, en, ese, en términos de media, de transmisión de comunicación y de información, es un mundo donde la represión y la opresión solo va a aumentar. Y yo creo que todos los países tienen que empezar a, a crear iniciativas que puedan combatir ese tipo de represión gubernamental y corporativa de la transmisión de la información. The ideals should travel and I hope that there will be an increased thirst for that among the general public and they will actually demand that uh, we open up societies and therefore we will uh, uh, at least be aware of uh, corruption and wrongdoing, the first step actually towards correcting them. That's a democratic way. People think it is so complex, but it's so simple. I mean, it's just as soon as you have attached to it uh, law, then people get scared. Uh, but it's really simple stuff. You know, and in general, I have no idea what effect it's going to have. You know, well, just, it remains to be seen. Uh, but so far, it's had good impact. Uh, so if that would be the only achievement to get all these issues up on the table and set, uh, set an example for others and to raise the awareness, then I would definitely be quite pleased. But of course I won't finish until it's all done. <laughs>
uh, court cases, figuring out what's been happening, how it's been happening, what needs to be fixed. Then once you figure all that out, you can start fixing it. I know some good friends of mine have actually started projects where they are writing laws in preparation for crisis. So they just just like when they did the Patriot Act in the United States, they had this like big book of laws that take away the rights of people prepared for the crisis. And then it was just passed through the parliament there without any proper debate. Uh, and people didn't even know what they were voting for. So um, that's one way of dealing with it. Uh, People are creative. I'm sure that they, they will find ways. If they want something like the Icelandic Motor Media Initiative in Spain, I know they can do it. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, hacking into the law, understanding how it works, and catching the spirit of the nation. Um, and that's how you get stuff done. You, you have to understand both the inside and the outside of the system. It's just like a very thin veil. Uh, and if you make sure you see through it both ways, then you really can get things done quite quickly. Você pintou uma imagem da Islândia como uma coisa muito única, pero que não é uma coisa muito única, é uma coisa que poderia passar em qualquer país, como porque sempre tem que analisar comparativamente. Então, dá igual se o país tem 300 mil pessoas ou 300 milhões de pessoas. Se a grande parte da gente vai à calle proporcionalmente, pode cambiar as coisas, por exemplo, nesse caso. Então, esse tema de que em Islândia é algo aislado e que só poderia passar em Islândia, eu creio que isso serve muito aos interesses da gente que quer manter o status quo no mundo. Mas não, como não tem nada a ver com a Islândia, a lo mejor talvez tiveram mais, mais ganas de cambiar as coisas, mas não significa que só eles poderiam cambiar as coisas. Like I always tell my friends from other countries, they're sort of inspired by what's been happening in Iceland and they think, oh, we can't do it, you know, in our country because things are this or that or blah, blah, blah. You know, we are too big or there's a tradition of this. Uh, prior to the crisis, there was no way that we could have done any of these things. And, and the good thing about uh, the situation in Europe, even if it's very difficult for many, it is that you're heading into a very good crisis. And I say good crisis because crisis is the only time when you can get real changes done. When there is a shift in society and people become aware of that a change is needed. Now very often the people in power will uh, actually become more oppressive and it's a dangerous time. Uh, so you have to be aware of what they will try to impose on you. And at the same time be ready with something like you know, the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative or initiative to give people more power. We could do that here, uh, despite the fact that we were in, in complete nepotism. I, often I try to explain to people how Iceland was prior to the collapse and it's sort of getting back into that. Uh, not completely, because we have managed to put in some uh, direct democracy tools and so forth. Um, but uh, we were like Grand Sicily. Uh, except there were no guns. People were just character assassinated if they spoke up against the people in power. And they couldn't get any work, uh, they couldn't, they, their reputation was destroyed and so forth in their fields. So if we can do it, you can. Uh, and I think it's very important that people are aware of this. That, you know, as soon as they start to sell themselves the idea that, you know, we can't do it, then of course you can't do it. Uh, but if you believe you can do anything, then anything is possible. That is enough. It is enough for you to say to yourself that you can do it. Um, then you need to start believing it. And then you need to go and change the world. It is a, an ideal of, of almost a utopian proportion. But I'm pretty sure that, that we are in a state now where we need utopians. We have, uh, after the end of the Cold War, and the fall of the Berlin Wall, we have lived in the Western societies in a state of, uh, of, uh, of existence without guiding lights and utopias. And uh, this is a, a little proposal which uh, might be a good contribution for, uh, by Iceland towards uh, 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 healthier and better societies. Every nation has its own way, but I think the key word there, and I think the key word for Europe is being creative about finding solutions and not not necessarily thinking how it would have been done. It's always important to learn from the experience, but we also need to let go of systems that are not working anymore.